Bonsoir, bonsoir à tous, bonsoir. Bonsoir à tous. Good evening, everybody. And welcome to the 17th uh, video game masterclass, or the 17th West Thrill, to welcome you tonight. I would like to welcome you on behalf of our partners, Jeux Vidéo Magazine, the Cité des Sciences de l'Industrie, and so to and Orange. So we're very happy to welcome uh, Christian Cantemassa, lead designer and uh, writer of Red Dead Redemption. So, of course, he is close to link to the story of a legendary studio, Rockstar. So, he's done GTA Manhunt 1, Manhunt 2, GTA San Andreas. He supervised the development of a complex game that took five years to see the day, Red Dead Redemption. And then afterwards, he set up his own uh, structure, Sleep Deprivation Lab, and script doctoring for video games, and uh, he worked as well on the... And so along with video games, Christian also made a science fiction film with Norman Reedus and his own comic series. So you see this massive career, there's one thing that's always there, and it's always telling a story, and whatever the medium. And if it's here tonight is to talk about another story, the story of his life, his career, we're going to talk together about the importance of narrative in video games, and of course, take you into the background, into the... Uh, Wings of Red Dead Redemption. I'm sure we're going to have a great John evening. John Marston and the Wild West are waiting for us. challenge was to create something new. Mesdames et messieurs, je vous prie de bien Ladies and gentlemen, Christian Cantamesa. He's here. Hi, Christian. Hi. Welcome. Hi, thank you. Welcome, Christian. We're going to go over here. Christian speaks French. So, Christian speaks French, right? Uh, <laughs> perfect, perfect French. We spent a few months in France, but uh, we're going to uh, do a bit of French together. But uh, I think you don't really speak much French, do you? Uh, not good enough to. Uh, to give these people a good time, no. So first of all, just to think, before we start the masterclass, Christian is here only for you tonight. He's here because he was thrilled by the idea of a masterclass to talk about his career. So I think we have a round of applause for that already. So, we're going to be talking about your whole career tonight. We're going to start at the beginning, like all our masterclasses, begin at the very beginning. So, when you were young, there we go, look, here's a little photo of you. You come from a little fishing village in Italy called Savona. You travelled a lot. Tell me about what it was like when you were a kid growing up. What were you like? Um, so, yeah, I, uh, like you said, I grew, uh, I grew up in Italy. Um, I, I spent some time travelling with my family. Uh, um, and I ended up settling in a small town called uh, Rapallo, which has become my uh, spiritual home. Um, and uh, it was it was awesome. Like Italy is such a such a wonderful place to grow up for a kid, where you have on the one hand, uh, you know, 
great food and great weather, and on the other you have history and mythology, uh, great sources of inspiration. And um, I just remember, you know, just even just playing in these cr crazy sort of medieval towns and imagining of being like a like a knight or a, yeah. like an adventurer. And um, very near to the village where I ended up spending most of my uh, childhood growing up, uh, there's Genova, and Genova is where Christopher Columbus set uh, sail to go and find America. So there's like a lot of um, a lot of adventure okay. in the air. Do you remember your first contact okay. with yeah. video games? The first memory, what is it? Um, I remember being like a young kid, a little older than <laughs> that. Look at, I looked like a little angel, didn't I? <laughs> um, yeah, and then you couldn't tell if that little kid made manhunt. But uh, <laughs> such is life. But um, uh, yeah, my first experience with, with, with games was uh, just like a six, seven-year-old kid, um, not tall enough to uh, reach the arcade cabinet to play Donkey Kong. Um, and so my mom would... Uh, prep me on a stool and kind of make sure that she had a, a little bit of peace in her day, I would go to the park uh, and, and I would have a little tricycle or a little bike and all I would do is just go to the video games and stop there and she would be like, you gotta go and ride your bike <laughs> but, and I would say, I rode it here. So, um, so that's, my, that's my first memory, an arcade uh, playing Donkey Kong. Then afterwards, you're quite struck by a lot of us here, by LucasArts games, by Monkey Island, uh, Tentacle Manic Mansion. I mean, what did it make you think? Did it reveal something to you in video games? Um, sorry, I didn't catch the final part of your question. Did it? No, I was wondering whether discovering these games made you reflect about what video games were becoming. Yes, absolutely. Um, it's interesting that you asked me that question because um, those early story-driven games like Maniac Mansion in particular and, uh, and later on The Secret of Monkey Island and the Sierra games were the games that I was playing and kind of slowly realizing that games could tell a story and that games had characters. In particular, um, Maniac Mansion, I remember it vividly because of the characters because you could choose three out of a uh, cast of characters and um, and the story would change a little bit and um, and that was you know for the little me that was uh, I was playing it on my Commodore 64 um, and and it was just an eye opener because of most of the games I'd played before were very twitchy sort of shooter maps um, and and Maniac Mansion was the first game where I it, it, I had a moment where I was like, wait a minute, I'm not a spaceship, I'm not a, a, an alien butchering space marine, I'm actually somebody talking to people and collecting, like I'm, I'm writing the story with the characters. And um, it was a big influence for, for the work that we do later. And an even bigger influence was uh, The Secret of Monkey Island because, um, because that game kind of, I was at a point when I was trying to decide what I would do in my life and what I would do in my writing and should I write movies or should I write comic books, what should I do? And then I played The Secret of Monkey Island and it was very vivid to me the idea that there was something in this new medium, the early 90s, there was something in this new medium that would be as powerful as film, be as powerful as television and, um, and really I had a shot uh, you know, getting in there because it was so new that I was like, hey, maybe I can sneak in uh, and somebody will be crazy enough to give me a job. Uh, and so it happened. And that's what, what happened, happened, right? Yeah, so you started off in video games. 1996, some friends of yours asked you to give a hand on a game called The Watchtower. <laughs> you have everything here. Um, yeah, that's... Um, the story of the watchmaker was literally, yes, the story of the watchmaker literally came as a one-page um, desperate desperation product <laughs> because I, I was out of school, I was working as a waiter at the time, really not my career, um, especially I, I feel bad for the people that I had to uh, wait on. But, um, and, and so friends of mine were uh, working in video games and I had spent some time in, in the UK sort of 
interacted with the community over there and in Italy interacting with the community over there. And um, these friends of mine were working with a company called Team 17, which is still going strong today. Great, great fan of theirs. They made the games that I grew up playing on the Amiga, like Alien Breed and um, Body Blows and all those great games, Manus. Um, and so they basically said, we're doing this great game. Uh, we're, you know, we're working with this great company. Uh, we have everything but the story. Um, and so, we, uh, you know, what game is it? It's an adventure game. <laughs> the story is kind of important. And so they were like, but if you write a one-page treatment, we can show it to the publishers, and if they like it, maybe we'll hire you to write the whole thing. And so that literally was my foot in the door. I was like, I, I better do a good job here because I could uh, get hired and make some money. And um, And I ended up... That one page ended up working out, and I got hired, and then I wrote the whole game, and then I wrote the whole dialogue of the game, and then I ended up writing the puzzles for the game and learning a little bit about game design because I didn't know anything about game design at the right. time. Um, so, so that was that that thing there was the very first right. thing that Could happened for me. Yeah, at the time, there was no training, really. There were no courses, there was no internet to find uh, sources, forums, exchanges, whatever. So how did you learn how to write for video games? Just by trial and error? So it was in the time when I started working on, on the watchmaker, um, just to give some context, um, that was the time when a, on a website called Gamma Sutra just launched. I think I was user number five or something. Mm -hmm. it, it had just come out. Um, there were no books on how to write games or be a game designer. And uh, the closest thing that I could find was um, uh, sort of like a self-published book by Chris Crawford, like a great, great game designer, that um, was his experience creating um, Balance of Power. And it was really, he called it the art of video game design, and it was a downloadable thing from his website. And uh, that was it. It was like a 20-page sort of uh, primer on how to design games for the Atari, basically. Um, no writing whatsoever. Um, and so it was like a learn by doing. It was um, a step at a time, play games. And story. the beauty of stories is that they're universal. There's I'm sure you have a question in there about what's the difference between writing for movies, games, comics, yeah. and I'll, <laughs> I'll answer that later. But, um, but for me, it really was just embracing character and, and trying to evoke the memories that I had when I was playing these games and, um, and just failing a lot. <laughs> <laughs> okay. After uh, The Watchmaker, you were embauched at uh, Ubisoft, first in Milan. So then you are a good bookmaker, you work on uh, Donald Duck Quack Attack and Arena uh, as well. <coughs> and what was that like at the time? Um, sorry, I, I keep having trouble with this. Could you? I, uh, I talk about the Ubisoft uh, time where you were working. Um, Ubisoft times. Um, after I wrapped up my work on The Watchmaker, I, it was like a contract gig, so I was kind of looking for my next thing. And um, my plan was to just uh, move to the UK. Or uh, There's not that many software developers in Italy, at least not at the time. And, um, and so it happened that as I'm looking for a place to go and where to move, Ubisoft opens a studio in Italy. Um, it, it's life is like that, right? It's like you don't know what's going to happen, and then all of a sudden, a major company opens a games development studio, just uh, you know, a few miles away from where you live. So I um, I ended up working there with a, with a bunch of people that I had you know met through um, working on ga in games in Italy because it's such a small community, and um, and it was it was really like the first time where I was in a, in an environment where there were so many other developers working on games. It was um, the watchmaker was made at the time, but maybe five people. Um, there was no QA. There was like two artists, one animator, two programmers, and me. Um, and um, and at, at the Ubisoft Milan studio, there was like 50 people or something, and everybody was doing something different. And um, 
and the games being built there, it, it was almost like people knew what they were doing, yeah. as opposed to tomorrow is another day, I gotta figure out what's gonna happen there. Um, so it was, it was a great learning experience for me. And also it was the first time where um, I had to actually design a game, yeah. or not necessarily create a game, um, but I had to build levels for a game, yeah. which is something really, really different from writing words for a game or coming up with puzzles for a game. And, and Ubisoft was a great place to learn. I had some very uh, uh, interesting Frenchmen mm -hmm. teach me how to, uh, to design a game. And, um, and I, 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 it kind of really opened a whole new mm -hmm. uh, skill set for me. Mais tu as quand même des, des envies d'ailleurs, en tout cas, tu as envie d'intégrer un studio. So you had the desire then, you wanted to be a part of a studio with that makes games that fit you. And so you send a CV to DMA Design, um, which is part of Rockstar, and then they did GTA 2, right? Um, DMA Design, uh, when I joined them, they were working on uh, GTA 3 already. Um, and my move over there was kind of um, a bit of a reactionary move, if you will. Um, I think I had, I was lucky enough to work on like really popular properties while, while I was at Ubisoft, and I and it was a great learning experience. But um, I ended up working on more like um, like a young for games for a younger audience, which is great. But um, for me, in my like twenties and like full of uh, adrenaline and wanting to make a statement. I felt like it, it wasn't my match. Um, it's everybody loves Donald Duck and I you know, learned to love him and hate him and love him again. Um, but, but at some point I felt like Donald wasn't, it wasn't my Donald. So, so I, wanted to, I wanted to move um, and try something different. And so I guess like I went from like Donald Duck to Grand Theft Auto. I mean, it, I've, I literally, I went like, okay, who is doing the most violent, vile games out here? Um, and, and that was the time when I literally didn't do much of a plan for where I wanted to go work. Um, I saw an article on IGN about these developer in Scotland that I remembered because, uh, again, DMA design was, you know, Amiga. Mm -hmm. I played a lot of Amiga. It was like Team 17, DMA design. Um, and um, Lemmings, I played a hell out of Lemmings. And then um, they were building GTA, Grand Theft Auto, in 3D. And people were like panning them. They were like, it's never gonna work, look at it, ha ha ha. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I was like, great, I got a shot. <laughs> like, uh, you know, obviously if these guys are getting so much rejection, they're gonna be open-minded to to the world of possibilities. And so um, I ended up sending my resume. I went over there for, you know, for an interview, for a chat. It was a very informal interview. And um, I chatted with the producer of GTA, Mr. Leslie Benzies, who is still a friend of mine to this day. And I think at some point during the interview, him or someone asked me, um, why do you want to come work here? And I said, because you guys have the balls to make these sort of games that nobody else would do. And, and, and Leslie was like, you're hired. <laughs> and that was it. Mm -hmm. I didn't do a programming test. I didn't like that. Mm -hmm. So like a week later, two weeks later, I was in Scotland from Italy. So, uh, you know, culture shock. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and I ended up not being able to work as much in GTA mm -hmm. 3 as I had expected to do because I... I played it and I gave feedback and I worked with the um, camera guy for a bit and um, I did some voice recording for the Italian <laughs> pedestrians in the game, the mafia guys, obviously. <laughs> um, and then um, and then there was this other game that was starting up called Manhunt and um, and they, they felt like because I had this sort of film interests. I had studied a lot of film before getting in games and I'd worked on story driven games. Um, I was really interested in camera work and storytelling. So they were like, yeah, why don't you take a look at that game mm -hmm. and see if you, you know, want to be the designer of that game. And, 
I had been at the company for you know maybe a few months and it became like the lead designer of the game, um, and that was exciting. Okay. Let's talk about Manhunt, but before let's talk a little bit more about GTA 3 because if I'm not mistaken, you worked on the camera placement for the cars in GTA 3, so there were some filmatic cameras, and I think you had the ideas there. At least you were working on that, and that was relatively new at the time, right? Yeah, I, um, I mean, I, it was me and, a, and another programmer that was doing all the camera work for the characters and the camera that kind of, uh, when they were talking about uh, the French Connection and all those movies, and, um, and kind of that's where that idea came from. Um, I'm not gonna take credit mm -hmm. for that, but it's something that I share. It's, it's a tiny experience that, um, that I had with that team that um, that makes me happy because um, because I, I I'm a visual storyteller. I love whenever you can help tell a story with with images, and I love the fact that just a button press that probably was nothing at the time was um, you know was a way for the players to actually feel like they were a little bit into their movie. Later on, in another GTA game, I ended up doing something a little similar, which was the uh, the camera to take uh, pictures with um, in San Andreas. I, I coded that and I did that. And again, it was one of those things that we thought nothing of it. And now every game has a you know take a snapshot <laughs> feature. Yeah. So so for me, it was it was fun to be able to sometimes in these games like play with uh, the camera and some some of the things that I had learned. Um, but then of course, in, in a GTA game, is such a such a global project a lot of you throw an idea in there and then it travels like it's like a life it's like an organism you throw something in there and then it goes around and it grows into uh, into an idea Okay, now let's talk about manhunt you're the game director where did you get the idea for manhunt um, it's a bit crazy a bit twisted yeah uh, so obviously like a very family friendly game that one <laughs> um, it, so like I said I was I was um, moved on to that game and again as like a very small team that kind of was uh, growing up and um, the, in, in, a, in a story that's been like a little bit like a repeat for my career um, it always there's always a game or an idea for a game in search of a story and, and Manant was um, another case where there was a lot of story ideas or a world of possibilities and some very talented people working on it. And, and um, a game that was being developed in sort of like different ways. Is it first person? Is it third person? Um, very experimental. Um, that, that was very characteristic of um, at least the early days of uh, DMA and Rockstar. Lots of trying things, it's, it's beautiful when, when you can afford to do that. Um, and uh, so I, I feel like me and who the other person that I would credit as the co-creator with me of Manant, um, Alan Davidson, who is um, an illustrator. He really, he, he really is like, um, like a comic book illustrator. He's like um, you know, Frank Miller in a way. He's this very dark graphic style. And um, and we we were trying to work together on what the the story for this game, where you're basically being chased, um, could be, and you're hiding and you're being chased. And Sam Hauser, the the president of the company, really wanted to make a, a horror game. In fact, he told me, uh, you know, Christian, I I want I want to make a a horror game, but where there's no zombies, no vampires, no monsters, not, none of that, none of that stuff. <laughs> You know, just 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 make it scary. Yeah, easy. And then I think that Alan and I were talking, and he was drawing stuff, and he drew this um, underpass with the player running away, but you can't see him. We can only see like his shadow or slower part of his body, and there's these shadows of the people chasing him. And when I saw that image, I immediately thought of a clockwork orange. And I thought, hey, 
wouldn't it be scary if you were the bum, like the homeless guy that gets beaten up by this gang and you, you know, you're in that role? And I think that that was the origin of the idea because after that, we started kind of riffing off that sort of like you're being hunted by a gang and I came, you know, I came up with a backstory for the protagonist and made him a serial killer because that's what you do. Um, when you're in your 20s and you're writing scary stories. And um, yeah, so it, it went from there. And then the snuff movie thing, just uh, I, I wrote the first draft of the screenplay and we needed, um, we needed uh, to put everything together, to put all these different um, emotions that would come up together. And uh, again, I think talking to Alan, it's like, why isn't this like a... Why isn't this like a snuff film? Like we, we kind of saw The Running Man and we were like, we don't want to do The Running Man. We don't want to do the 80s Arnold Schwarzenegger running away. Um, what's the twisted version of that? Oh, somebody's making a snuff movie and filming you while you're getting killed. Perfect. <laughs> so I wrote the first draft of the screenplay and that's pretty much what we ended up mm -hmm. um, creating. And then I worked on the CCTV camera look for it because it, it just felt very appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, that was, that's the history of the game. Quel souvenir tu gardes toi de cette époque parce que c'est quand même premier. What memories do you have of this time? Because you ended up having a huge amount of responsibility. You had to maintain the vision of the game. You had to defend it to the teams. What's your memories? Was it complicated? Um, so to, for this particular game, it wasn't overly complicated. Um, it, it, it can be, but um, I think that what, you, what you're trying to do when you, when you have a, a vision or an idea, vision is a very pr pretentious word, mm -hmm. but let's, let's use it. Um, what you're trying to do is you, there's so many people working on something, right? And it's like an orchestra. You have all these great musicians and they're all playing, right? But, and they're all masters of their instrument. But the, the guy that's sitting over, over here with the, with the viola and the guy sitting here lead violin. They can't, they can't hear each other and, and they, they can barely hear themselves and you actually don't want them to pay attention to, to the full orchestra, it's just impossible. So your job becomes kind of taking a step back and make, making sure that everybody's playing the same song. Um, and so that, with that analogy in mind, I felt like leading the charge for a game where there's so many people that are outstanding in what they do, um, you end up not wanting to tell them what to do as much as freeing them to do what they're great at and just trying to tell them, hey, this is the song we're playing. Let's jam together, but don't worry about hearing the guy over there. Just, you know, just uh, follow the tune and do the best you can. So, so I have to use an analogy, but that's kind of what it feels like. That's very interesting because I looked at a lot of interviews getting this master craft class ready, and I saw Leslie Benzi, I read Leslie Benzi's, and he talks about when making a rock star game, they all said it was kind of like having a rock band and trying to find the way to get all the players to play together. So it's interesting that you have that same analogy, you guys are from the same family. Now, on Manhunt, were you ever afraid of going too far? and the violence. Did you ever think, no, okay, but it's, it's very violent, but we have to go for it anyway? I don't think we approached it with the idea of making a game that would be banned in a couple of countries and, um, you know, let's meter, let's meter the violence so that we can, um, you know, get the most bang for the buck. I think the game was actually uh, Manant and Manant too, but primarily Manant. Um, it was a game about violence in our culture today and in video games in particular and it was almost um, a contemplation of violence. Um, we were trying to say something about violence and we were trying to say something about the role of the player and the role of the game makers in creating the violence and that's why we, we have a voice of a director who is literally the director of the game telling you you could do this or you could do that. And mostly the things that he's asking you to do are vile and violent and they're like for his gratification and the gratification of his audience, but you don't have to do it. Um, and we put a, a violence meter in the kills so that if you wanted to just get the job done or um, 
not even kill people? You could, and the, the lowest, quickest level of kills are actually not overly graphic. And then the longer you hold the button, the more graphic the deaths become, and, and actually the riskier it becomes for you to kind of perform it. And of course, everybody's going for <laughs> the deadliest. The and so we were thinking, what does that mean to people? Um, what does that mean when you're playing the game? Um, are you, are you going to be saying this is a violent game, or are you going to be saying I'm a violent person because I'm playing the game in this way? And I think that when it came out, people didn't fully, I think that the time wasn't right to have this particular conversation with people. Um, and, um, and, and these days, Manant has had a resurgence where you know, even Vice magazine was writing about it and people seem to um, appreciate it for what it is and not for like this scaremonger activity that we put up. But, um, but we never approached it saying, let's, let's do a blood and gore and guts video game. If anything, we approached it by saying, let's do like one of those horror movie type stories, like a video nasty that you could rent in a cheap sort of video store with those thrills and those scares. And, um, and let's, make, let's make a game that kind of transports you to that sort of atmosphere. Um, and, you know, Rockstar is all about choice. Mm -hmm. It's all about player choice. So, you know, for, for men it was the same. Ouais, c'est très intéressant ce que tu racontes, parce qu'on a souvent taxé euh, les jeux Rockstar de That's very interesting, de because uh, uh, Rockstar moi, games were always called very uh, excessive to violence, um, but I think the violence makes sense. Ça, what do you think about that, la, la this debate on gratuitous violence et, for the, en effet, in the Rockstar en fait, games? Moi, toi, if violence, I agree with you that the violence chose. tells a story or has something to do with the story, it's always important. What do you think about that? Um, the yeah, the player has everything to do about the, mm. the violence and has everything to do about the um the direction where the his side of the story is going. Now there is always an element of um you're just giving him the content mm. to, to play with. You're always just you know, the the, the player is not a, a creator, like a fully empowered creator. The player is more like an editor. Mm. You give editor of a film, right? You give the editor a, a bunch of strips of film. And he can do great things with these strips of film. He can take Darth Vader and make it into you know, a Star Wars Darth Vader moment and turn it into a comedy. Or you can take uh, you know, a comedy and turn it into horror. You just go on YouTube and you can see a lot of that. That's the power of editing. You, you can you know, look at Eisenstein. You can take a man with no expression, just change the objects he's looking at, and his expression seems to change. So it's quite empowering to tell a player, you can edit the content but the content is finite, and it's what we give you. And, and, and Rockstar has decided to create a particular, ad created, to cre decided to create a particular type of content, and I've worked with other companies that created different types of content. And um, it, was, I, it was always interesting for me to be able to do something that was um, a conversation builder and a conversation starter for popular culture. Right, not necessarily that what movies are doing or graphic novels are doing is not uh, very important. It is, it's super important, but they have it. F you, you can make a film and make it as violent or as peaceful uh, as you want. You can be Terrence Malick or you can be Quentin Tarantino and, and, and the audience will listen and think and engage. Same with a graphic novel, you can be Frank Miller and you can do Watchmen or you can do you know, uh, Superman. And, um, and the audience will listen. And games, for a very long time, especially at the time when Rockstar broke onto the scene, weren't part of the conversation. They weren't sitting at the grown-up table. They were sitting at the kid table over there. The grown-up were eating the meal and the games were eating pancakes over here. And I feel like it, you know, it took effort, and it took effort from a company like Rockstar um, to, to, to sit at the grown-up table and have a serious conversation about games. And violence was one of the elements that, um, that allowed that conversation to happen. It sounds crazy, but um, it, you know, it was one of the catalysts. And, and the maturity with 
with which some of these games treated uh, violence as opposed to uh, gratuitous and because I despite what the media said at the time, none of these games had you know gratuitous terrible violence. There were other games that had it, but but those games haven't passed the test of time. So what about GTA San Andreas? What was your role on GTA San Andreas? Um, San Andreas has a special place in my heart because is one of the f few, if not possibly the only one, where I didn't write for the game. Mm -hmm. Even in my earlier games at, at Ubisoft, even the Donald Duck game, um, I ended up doing some writing for it. Um, I did some writing in comic book form for the Game Boy Color version of that game. Mm -hmm. um, so I was always in there. And for San Andreas, um, I didn't write at all. And I was the game designer in charge of the ambient world. So um, I had a small team working with me, uh, primarily uh, programming, animation, and art. And, um, and our task was to take this significant sized map, <laughs> um, three cities and all the countryside in between, and make it come to life. Because the previous GTA games had a lot of ambient activity, lots of um, you know, really sophisticated things happening with traffic and with the pedestrians. But G with GTA, really, San Andreas really kind of pushed it to the next level. There was uh, stores where you could walk in, and there would be people ordering food and sitting down, and strip clubs with strippers, and you could throw money at them. And another highlight of my career for my <laughs> mom. And, um, you know, there was like people taking pictures. You could take pictures, like I said. And so um, it, was, it was very exciting for me to be given this opportunity to do something, A, very wildly different from what I had done. Um, and B, to be able to tell a story, the story of this world and the story of this character, without using words, without using language but just using the elements that you can see in the map. Um, what does it look like? What, 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 does a, the, what does the countryside look like in this world? Because it's not, you know, GTA is not the real world. GTA is the, the world looked through a lens. Um, so what does, what does the countryside look for in that world? What, what does the hood look like? Um, what type of people do you find in a particular area of town and what are they doing and what are their stories? And it was a lot of fun to kind of build these characters and these situations uh, in the map. And that experience served me really, really well later on for Red Dead Redemption because that game had a massive amount of ambient content and really there was a lot of head scratching until um, we realized that the answer was you know, hiding away in the little pedestrians taking pictures of the Monument Valley in, uh, in San Andreas. What do you remember about developing the game? Was it a massive game? I mean, was it massive development for Rockstar on the game? I mean, the team grew a lot for the game. What do you remember about this period? Was it uh, a lot of enthusiasm? Or was it hard work? What was it like? Um, certainly, the, all the time that I spent at uh, Rockstar in Scotland, this, was, this game was done at uh, Rockstar North, and I was at Rockstar North from 2000 to 2005. And it was like a dream come true in terms of um, work experience. Um, and it was a bunch of young lads just wanted to make games. And one of those work environments where you, you, know, you say, something and the other person finishes the sentence that you're about to say or that you've just started and um, so it was very exciting a little too exciting at times because um, it was also a place where we you know we worked very hard and we set our own rules um, to play by um, so I remember it fondly I I, I, I remember the, the freedom to come up with ideas and try them in the game um, it's something that doesn't happen very often in, in the games business. It was a massive team for the time. I don't remember exactly how big, but, um, but it, 
it, Rockstar basically went from being doing two games at the time to just doing San Andreas. And um, obviously, on the success of GTA 3 and Vice City, that you know, we were allowed to do that. We also moved to newer offices, bigger offices, not in a deadly part of town like we, we were before. We were in Leith before, which is a part of Edinburgh that I don't know now, but back in the day, it was like train spotting, pretty much. That's where it's set, <laughs> so you can imagine. And so we moved to the good part of town. Um, and at the same time, it was intense. It was intense. It was uh, an intense time, especially if you, if you were an ambitious young guy that just wanted to, you know, put all these ideas out and try all this crazy stuff. And then, you know, I, I would work, I don't know, very long days. I think that um, the producer of the game told me when we finally finished the game, he told me that I had worked something like two years in one calendar year yeah. in terms of hours. Um, just, just in terms of like, you know, you never have to go home. You just get to work on your dream project. So, hey, I'll just camp here for a bit. And again, it's, it's um, what was really great about those times is that nobody was there telling you, work harder. I feel like they were there telling us, please go home because you're going to die. Like, <laughs> like that was, that was, and that's because every, and that's why everybody worked so hard because everybody was really invested in the game. And it was, it's that rock band analogy again. It's the orchestra again. You, you have, you have people like Leslie Benzies, Sam Hauser, Dan Hauser with their great ideas and great motivation and, um, and these great opportunities that they are giving you. And they say, just, go and play. And the last thing you want to do is pack up and go home and you know, watch ER. No, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> to stay here and I'm going to do something great. Um, and, and while that's you know, great when you're young, it kind of gets a little harder with the, with the age. You were talking about dialogue earlier on. I think one of the things about Rockstar is dialogue, from what I've understood, but it's quite complicated, you know. But uh, there's quite discreet management there. There's, you know, you want to have exchanges and dialogues. Is that one of the strengths of the studio? And is this kept up, you know, even during Red Dead, uh, you know, with the same teams despite the, uh, you know, the different grades, different positions? There's a real exchange. Everybody was allowed to have a good idea? Um, yeah, I would say everybody is always allowed to have a good idea um, and encouraged to have a good idea. Um, when you t were talking about dialogue for a second, I felt like dialogue in the game, um, which is important. But um, your dialogue in the game and amongst the people that create the game is really important. Um, and quite frankly, if one of the cleaners of the office came to me with a great idea to, to make the game better, I would take it for sure, because um, it's, it's all about the execution, right? It's, it's uh, you know, if somebody has a great idea, they should, they should give it, and everybody should be encouraged to, to give great ideas. Um, the problem becomes, what do you do with all these great ideas? And who is doing what with all these great ideas? That's when it gets tricky, because then you have you know, 200, 300 people, they all have great ideas, and, and it, you need a format. You need a forum for the ideas, and you need a format to keep that dialogue going. Um, so, so that's when it gets tricky. And, and on a game like, on a game like that, like Red Dead, it gets it very tricky, very quickly, uh, especially because there are like different teams in different parts of the world working together with different cultures, different time zones, different ideas for what needs to be done, it becomes more, um, more of a communication challenge. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes, you know, it's you, um, you have to figure it out. Right? You have to try and then correct it. Um, certainly, I didn't know much about large teams when I, <laughs> when I ended up working on uh, Red Dead Redemption, but uh, I had worked within a Rockstar on a large team for 
GTA San Andreas. And then I'd worked on smaller teams in a sort of leadership position for Madden. Mm -hmm. So I guess I had a, a little bit of clues here and there on what was going to happen. Avec le recul que tu as, ça fait quelques années maintenant que tu as quitté Rockstar. Now, with a step back, you left Rockstar North a few years ago now. What's the difference? I mean, what's, what's the strength of Rockstar? Of Rockstar? What makes it stand out? Um, well, I can only kind of speak okay. for myself, um, my opinion. I think that you can ask this question a bunch of different people and they'll have a bunch of different answers. Um, for me, Rockstar and Rockstar North in particular was... Um, a place where there was a great sense of um, camaraderie and a great sense of um, ambition, wanting to do, really wanting to change the world. Um, I've always insisted that, you know, my personal mantra is that great stories can change the world. And that's why I love stories so much. It doesn't matter if they're written or in movies or in comics or in games. And I felt like uh, there was a very kindred spirit at Rockstar where everybody there in, in their own way wanted to change the world. We wanted, we wanted to change video games. Um, and that's to me what make it, made it like an exceptional place to work. Uh, I, I'm sometimes even saying a place to work doesn't sound right because you think of an office, you think of uh, ties and suit. And Rockstar always felt more like uh, a virgin airplane, right? You know, with the purple lights and the comfy seats and the crazy atmosphere and having fun and working hard. Working hard. It's not like party time. It's it's kind of like the party is the work that you get to do. Um, but but that that's what I remember the most and most fondly. And also people that are not afraid. Like remember when I when I interviewed there, I said you have the balls to do these sorts of games. It's it's people that are not afraid to take risks, and all these games for them were risks. You can look at GTA V right now and go, ha, ah, money! There's so much money. They're making so much money. But when when GTA III was being done in 3D, people were like, it can't be made. It's never gonna work. Any work. And then um, you know. Red Dead, nobody's ever going to buy a Western game. And they, they the people disagreed. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and so it, I feel like, uh, you know, GTA Online, same thing. It's like, no, you can only do MMOs online. Well, check it out. So, so I feel like th that's the thing that made Rockstar what it is. It's just not like the violence, the gangs, the just, just the risk-taking, the, the, the will to kind of go out there and, and make great stuff and really um, change change the world. It's like, like Apple, right? Apple wanted to change the world by making the iPhone and the Apple II, and Rockstar wanted to change the world by making these great games. Okay. So at the end of 2004, you wanted to go elsewhere. You wanted to go, uh, you know, like, uh, you wanted to leave Rockstar and uh, go to uh, cinema. But uh, Les Benzis has a project in San Diego. <laughs> um, you know a lot about me. Um, so, uh, so d d you, you, work, you work on, uh, you know, you're, you're a creative person and you work on a bunch of stuff for a couple of years and then a couple more years. And in the back of my mind, there was always the idea that, um, you know, I, I wanted to be a storyteller and I wanted to try my hand, at my hand at different things and maybe I could do movies and maybe I could go down to London and, you know, make cups of tea at some of these production companies and eventually, you know, slip a script to someone. Um, so I had that going on in my head. And um, Man and Ted come out very cinematic game, and uh, Man on 2, I was working on another very cinematic game, GTA. I was feeling like maybe, maybe I need to hit the reset button here because I don't want to, I don't want to fail because I'm repeating myself. And, and I didn't see any, anything productive coming, coming out, just you know, failing because I've run out of things that I'm good at doing. And, um, 
And then the conversation was basically, we have this studio in San Diego, they were um, working on a Western game. Here's a video, mm -hmm. play the video, this looks cool. Um, the Old West Project. And um, you know, maybe you could, uh, we, we want to make uh, an open world game and you have some experience here um, doing these sorts of games. So why don't, why don't you move to San Diego and um, see how that goes. See if you like it there. And you know that was like, you know that that was like the Godfather. That was like the offer that you can't refuse. Right? <laughs> Short of finding uh, the horse, of the head of a horse in my bed, <laughs> that was the next nicest. Actually, that was the nice version of that because I thought like, wow, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. So um, so it's 2005, mm -hmm. and I'm in Scotland, and it's raining, and it's cold, and it's like, miserable. And you wanna you wanna work all the time because you get out and it's just. <laughs> It's raining upwards, and um, and I move to San Diego, and I get out of the plane. It's palm trees, and it's you know 80 degrees Fahrenheit. There's the ocean. It smells different. It smells of flowers. It's not raining at all, and it looks like a movie. It it took like a couple of weeks just to kind of go where what's <laughs> hap what happened here. Um, and uh, and so that's yeah that's that's how I moved to San Diego. It was uh, on an invitation from from Leslie that um, that that, that, I c that I couldn't refuse. And of course, I should add that it's not like somebody picked up the red telephone and was like, "He's coming." And there was no bad signal waiting for me. Like I had to have a conversation with the guys in San Diego running the show and kind of explain what I was doing and what I was contributing because um, there was, Rockstar doesn't work with phone calls and people getting a job. A Rockstar works with like, okay, go and interview at your own company, you know, if you want to do something different from what you're doing, whether it's the desk over here or the studio over there. Um, but I was lucky, like always in my life. <laughs> I just, uh, you know, managed to say the right things at the right time and uh, that was the right time, it turns out, because uh, that was the beginning of uh, Red Dead. So we're going to talk about Red Dead Redemption. We're going to have a quick trailer to give you an idea. A road in the gang. They left me to die after I'd been shot. I left the gang after the gang left me. I tried to go straight. I did. Then I got me more trouble. You can't change jobs! Do deals with outlaws, boy. Yeah, you do. You are the bounty hunter, huh? Your country loves to make trouble in mine. Perhaps you come to hunt me, huh? <laughs> you always did have a high opinion of yourself, John. This is America, where a lying, cheating degenerate can prosper. What will you do now, Mr. Marston? Now I'm gonna take my time and go after him the less kind way. It's gonna be a bloody job. I don't know any other kind. I was right all along. The savage heart cannot be conventionally civilized. Maybe you live in a different America than we. I'm gonna cut you up piece by piece. <laughs> Civilization is a truly beautiful thing, Mr. Marston. Well, old man, looks like things is about to get settled once and for all. So it seems. A masterpiece, a masterpiece. Yeah, I'm not a fan, don't worry. <laughs> so, Rockstar San Diego, you, you went along, there's about 15 people working. There's not a lot of you working on the game, on the Old West project. Have you got a particular memory of these first weeks of development with this small team? 
Well, first of all, that brought back a lot of memories. I haven't seen that game in a long time. Um, it, it was it was kind of like um, a little bit like going back to the beginning. So many of these companies I worked for were at beginnings. You know, Ubisoft, Milan was the beginning, and um, Rockstar, DMA design was certainly the beginning for GTA 3 and Manhunt. And, and, and so it was great to go back to San Diego and that studio, as Angel Studio, as had been going for years and had made some great games. Um, but it, for the Red Dead team, it was the beginning. And uh, certainly th it was a compact group of people. Um, back in the day, there was... Uh, the Midnight Club franchise was the bread and butter of the studio. Great games, great driving games. Um, and they were like th over there. There was just a handful of us over here, the Western boys. And then there was the Rockstar was building their internal uh, engine uh, development team. Um, and so it wasn't, by any stretch of the imagination, it wasn't a small studio. But the team working on Red Dead was a small team. Um, and it was in a sort of ec exploratory phase to figure out what, what game we're going to make. What's this Western game going to be? Because there was a few ideas, obviously, and um, Sam Hauser and Dan Hauser always have a very clear idea of what the game needs to be. Um, but in terms of like the story, the world, the the map, um, all that was still kind of like a big question mark. And also the biggest question mark was um, how do you make a GTA-like game where you don't drive cars, there's no buildings or very few, there's no traffic to drive around, um, wh what are you gonna do in the game? So that was like sort of like what was going on. Then there's the, sto the story, but also, what are we gonna do in this game? This is gonna be like this large amount of land with nothing to do. Just by yourself, the most boring game ever made. <laughs> um, so. So a lot of challenges there then. So the writing, what about the writing for Red Dead? So the writing of the game, and the story, or did you uh, did you stick the story onto the game? How was it done in parallel? How did you go about doing the two? Um, the story and the game were kind of hand to hand, and um, that was primarily done because when I started there as the lead designer, um, there was very little of the game, and um, and nothing of the story, with the exception of maybe the idea of um, taking a character as the lead that was at least um, spiritually inspired by Red Dead Revolver, which was the prequel. Um, so without getting too much into the details of how the game <laughs> was uh, put together, I would say that the um, the ideas for the story and the ideas for the gameplay and the ideas for the characters were, and the ideas for the map, were all kind of coming up at the same time. And again, it was a case of having great, amazing talent on the team. Darren Bader, the other director of the game, is an illustrator and a painter whose work I could hang in my living room. I mean. The guy did like cards for Magic the Gathering, you know, the, the illustra Dungeons and Dragons books, like beautiful stuff. He would he would paint, he would paint stuff to 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 show his team how the game would have to look like, um, and and then there's uh, Ted Carson, the technical director of the game, who was absolutely like the type of programmer, the type of I would say engineer, a software engineer that, that you want to work with because he was really interested in the story of the game and the gameplay of the game. And it wasn't, it was never, a lot of times you work with programmers and they're like, they feel like what you, you are trying to do is very difficult or challenging or boring. And so they're, 
the go-to place is maybe from a place of self-defense. And, um, and with Ted, and, and consequently the team we built around him, it was a place of welcoming and yes, we can do better than that. Ah, you wanna do, you wanna do a rope? We can do better than that. We can do a lasso. You want to do clothes? We can do better than that. We can have flags everywhere and clothing on the characters. And this was in a time when clothing wasn't that common. Let's put it everywhere. Um, so, so it was really coming from a you know place of everything is possible for the art. Everything is possible for the technology. Everything is possible for the animation. Um, Sung Soon Park, the lead animator. Uh, working in tandem with like the leads, uh, the the lead animation team in New York and the motion capture direction, uh, Rod Edge, um, everybody coming from a place of like a horse. Yeah, we can make a horse, and it's gonna look like the real thing. And of course, we had not done that before. Mm -hmm. Like n nothing of the things that we wanted to put in the game, the lasso, that you can lasso people. Hey, let's make it so that you can tie them up and then drop them on, a tr on the rail tracks. It was never been done before. It's not like you could look at something and go, oh yeah, let's do it like that. Um, the horse, yeah, sure, there's like horse riding games. Um, we looked at Zelda, we looked at Shadow of the Colossus, but it, it wasn't like what we wanted to do. Um, and these people just dove in and they built a team that allowed them to always commit, always take the risk. Um, and for me and for the team that I was building for the missions, the story, the ambient world, um, we all really tried to do the same thing. We tried to say, okay, let's do something with the story and the gameplay and the narrative and the characters that you can't just go and buy a game and has that. So let's not do a spaghetti western because there is Red Dead Revolver and there is um, Gun, Let's do let's do let's do a game that is, you know, more like a Sam Peckinpah movie, and um, and that's when we started talking internally, and I don't know I don't know who came up with it. Maybe I came up with it. I don't know if I want to take the credit for it, but I remember very vividly writing a post-it and gluing it to my screen, and that post-it was the death of the West, and that kind of became the mantra they kind of immediately glued everyone together. Like the animation team, the art team, the coding team, the mission team, the story team, everybody knew what we were trying to do. And if you looked at something, if it wasn't the death of the West, you wouldn't make it into the game. It's like very simple, like you come up with an idea, hey, let's do this character that does cabot wheels over there. Is it death of the West? No, then, it, then it's not in the game. Oh, let's do this scene where you're riding along in a, and there is a stagecoach being robbed by bad guys. Is that that of the West? Yeah, it is. Okay, let's put it in. And let's have Mexico. Let's have Mexico. We could have set the game wherever we wanted, but we felt like if we're telling a story about the death of the West, then let's, let's have Mexico be where the West can still continue. And you have this sort of, the West is dying over here, but you can still find bits over here, but in a unique flavor. Um, and, so, and that's how we kind of worked. Everything, game, story, different people, New York, uh, San Diego, uh, Edinburgh, everybody that was coming on board into the game, it was you know, united by this, um, this idea, this concept. So this idea, the idea of the death of the West, what, what inspired you? What were your references? Which films inspired you? Um, I was talking to Sam a lot in, in the early period of the gestation of the game about what kind of game he, he wanted to, to make with this Western and what he felt would be um, proper, a proper rock star Western. And inevitably, at least for me, when I talk about stories and vibe, I always end up talking about movies. I'm a big movie fan, I'm a movie buff. I, you know, I even sometimes make them. So, so we were talking about the movies that for us had that atmosphere and that vibe. And one movie that we settled on and that we, we both went like, yeah, is um, Sam Peck and Spud, The Wild Bunch. And The Wild Bunch has that sort of like, the, the year of the cowboy is gone. And uh, I felt like 
that was where that was the playground, the sandbox where Sam wanted to play, where Dan Hauser wanted to play to, to tell a story in, where I wanted to play to, to build the game and uh, create the narrative universe for the game. And then when I, you know, I, I went back home and now my job was, okay, what's the through line of this story? Before we start bringing in all these people that are gonna write it and do the cinematics and do the gameplay, the missions. What's what's the backbone for the character? I need to put something. I need the one page that's gonna get this thing done. And I remember that in the Wild Bunch there is um, there is a character that's hunting them, and it's um, and it's sort of like a guy that has betrayed the gang or has left the gang. And I felt like God wouldn't. He's not a protagonist at all, but I was like, wouldn't it be interesting to see the story from that guy's perspective? And wouldn't it be interesting to be the guy that was part of the gang, was one of the boys, did great things, and is not at all interested in getting back with the gang. You know, the times are over. I'm over there farming. I've got a wife. I buried my past. Maybe nobody knows about it. And then, you know, the past catches up with you. You can't run away, right? You gotta, you gotta face the consequences of your actions. And so the past catches up with him, and he is sent off on this great last adventure, um, which is coincidentally finding the people that were potentially your best friends, and either bring them to justice to be executed or execute them yourself. Um, so, so that was kind of like the nugget of the idea that everybody then, you know, I, I pitched it and um, we entered deep conversations about it and everybody kind of contributed to make it the big wonderful game that Red Dead is. But I think it came from, from that place. You say, dans les masterclass, on a des petites surprises. On a des, des, des gens. Yeah, we've always des got surprises. Um, in our masterclasses, there's some questions from the audience. We have someone who wants to ask you a question now. Buongiorno, Christian. Come sta? I'm Patrice Desilets from Panache Digital Games here in Montreal. I got a question for you. How is history, culture, and language important in your work? Well, thank, <laughs> thank you, Patrice. Um, so, history, language, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick to a couple of those, and I'm going to say that stuff like history and mythology and research in general are super important for, for what I do and super important, I think, for everybody, in my opinion, that has an interest in writing um, for two reasons. First of all, because... They're a great source of inspiration, especially history and language and all the good stuff that Patrice mentioned there. Clearly another fan uh, of this sort of stuff. Just look at the wonderful games he's made. Um, instead of looking at another game or another, le let's find something that's identical and do a uh, photocopy. When you look at history and when you look at um, geography, and when you look at mythology, you can actually find the raw data that all these other things have come from. Um, so, I mean, obviously, you know, creativity is theft. You know, like you, you steal from the best, and you hope to be good enough to kind of masquerade what you're doing so that they can't tell exactly what you stole and what, what you interpreted. You know, at least that's what I think Picasso said, uh, steal from the best, art is stealing. But when you're stealing from history, geography, and mythology, I feel like you're stealing from the best. You're stealing from the stuff that's, um, that's almost like there for you to, to use. So 100% super important, and Rockstar in particular had, had when I was there, I don't know because I haven't been there for a while, but had a, a, a very encouraging policy of research, uh, dig deep, travel, take pictures, expose yourself to the elements, um, get in so that you can soak into the, into the material that you're creating, whether it's the, the wilderness of uh, 
you know, the desert in America, uh, learning about the period. Um, and, then, and then for something like Red right, Dead, you, again, it's not, it's not the real America. It's a, it's a version of America. So what elements do we want to amp up? And what elements do we want to downplay? And what is interesting for us? Now that you know everything about the you know, the FBI or what it was before it became the FBI and the Pinkertons and all that. What, what do you want to use and what, what is it, what is good literally materi literary material and what is, um, what is going to bog down you in details and is actually not going to help you tell the story. Um, so, so that's my approach for that. And it's interesting because um, I'm not a history buff. I, I love reading it and I, and I love, um, absorbing it and kind of putting it in the back burner and see what surfaces. But um, I end up working with a lot of like historical or mythological material and the even the comic book that, 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 that I've just worked on and it's coming out in 15 days or so, um, it's based on mythology, Greek mythology. Um, so so I, love, I love the, um, the richness of, uh, of history and, and geography and mythology. Thank you, Patrice. Patrice a une autre vidéo, mais qui est plus destinée maintenant au public. Another video, but this is for the audience. Uh, for the master classes, there's a message for you all. Bonjour tout le monde, Patrice Desilets, directeur créatif et cofondateur de Panache Jeux Numériques. Euh, je vous invite tous le 4 juillet de cette année à la Cité des Sciences pour ma master class personnelle, où je vais parler d'Assassin's Creed, Prince of Persia, 1666 et sûrement Ancestors of Humankind Odyssey, le projet sur lequel je travaille actuellement. On se revoit le 4 juillet. So see you there. Vous savez ce que vous faites en train de faire le 4 juillet? You know what you're doing on the 4th of July? Well, an anecdote. We'll be back to Christian here in a minute, but Patrice is going to be celebrating 20 years of video games with us. He came here the 3rd of July in 1976 at Ubisoft. Okay, let's continue with you. You were talking about dialogue, research. What's interesting is how you actually write. You were used to modern language with GTA. How can you uh, bring back this language that's disappeared? You, did you sort of create a like, Bible of dialogue that you gave to the authors with some typical expressions and those kind of things? Ah, what a great question. Um, so we had a few books on the, um, the language of the, of the period. And I, I can't speak for... Mike Unsworth and Dan Hauser, the, the other two co-writers of the game, I'm sure that they also um, had their own personal references to it. But for, for the team in San Diego and for myself, we, um, we, we, had, we had the references, um, there were not just texts on, that we found on like the way people spoke, but also, um, we had a collection of magazines and newspapers from the era where you could see the um, you could see the products that were consumed. You could see the the lingo that was being used. We used a lot of that for Wes Dickens, the snake merchant, in the game. Um, you could see some of the some of the crazy medicines that they were selling with the mm -hmm. cocaine in it and stuff. And um, we put that ob obviously we put that in the game. Um, so uh, and then it was a process of just um, selection, like I said, you, you, you look at the things they really work for um, to create the atmosphere of the time. And, um, but we certainly didn't want to do, we, we didn't want to do a, a period piece. We didn't want to do something that felt like uh, it was lifted from the pages of history and everybody is so 100% uh, accurate in the way they speak ba like back in the day. Um, I think that what was more interesting, at least for me, was the um, some of the customs of the air, some of the culture of the air. But then it's always fun to then inject a little bit of modernity into it, just enough so that the characters feel like you can connect to, um, and and they sound like modern in a way. Um, and then you you want to then surface all that with the context of the period so that you have something that is 
that feels like it belongs, but that you can connect. Because, because English was very different um, back in the 1900s. Um, and we, we didn't want to create something that was you know, alienating. Um, that said, there are beautiful works that, that go 100% in. I just recently saw a movie called The Witch, and The Witch is all written, all the dialogue is like Middle English. All the lines, they're like Middle English. Mm -hmm. And it's tough, but it's also a horror movie. So <laughs> if you don't understand what they say, they're going to get killed. <laughs> but, but, um, but unless you, I feel like unless you do that, unless you go full in and you have a, you have a very strong artistic reason to do that, then you use the, you use the culture and you use the color, and then it's actually better to do something that's modern, that, is, um, that, that connects to the audience today. People that, that might not speak like a cowboy, but speak like you. They, they are, they're like people you can connect to. On connaît euh, que on s'enfonçait que Rockstar n'est pas un studio connu pour sa censure. Okay, Rockstar isn't on known for censoring, of course, but uh, si je me pas, sur if I'm not wrong, in Red Dead there was one topic de that de you decided to uh, temper a bit, and that's racism. Uh, the Wild West, uh, the Wild West at the time, uh, very, uh, very present, very prevalent racism, and I, if I understand correctly, you decided to slow that down a bit. Otherwise, it would have made things too complicated. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There was, um, yeah, of course, the history. Uh, you know, we had a few, we have a few interesting conversations also in terms of like, what do we want to do with the Native Americans in the game, um, which are featured in the game. And the period we chose gave us um, an interesting angle because we're not quite at the time where we're, you know, cowboys shooting Indians and the John Ford type of movies, which you know, clearly have their own place in history, but um, it's a different conversation. We, 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 we have a, a time when the Native Americans have been pushed into reservations, and they're like, hey, you guys go over there. Here's this nice piece, Here's this nice piece of land that we kind of don't want, so you can have it. Mm -hmm. um, and so I feel like we, we wanted to just be authentic and honest. And nobody felt uh, we were demystifying the West. So we felt it was appropriate to demystify the cowboy and demystify some of the um, attitudes of the time. And we created, um, Dan actually created this character. Um, the anthropologist character, um, who who is just at least on the surface is the most racist, anti-Native American anthropologist that is studying them because they are obviously different. Uh, they have this different way of living, and they must think differently. And um, and that really was an attempt at saying, you know, look at look what mistakes we've made um, let's um, you know let's try and you know at least learn from a little bit from history and and simultaneously while we're making fun of some of these stupid white uh, men colonizing the savages arguments um, we created very strong Native American characters one of them actually saves your life and becomes like a like an important figure in the game, and the the very own bad guy <laughs> in the game is um, the final boss, is your mentor, and is this uh, white man that's gone Colonel Colonel Kurtz on us, almost like Apocalypse Now, and is embraced the life of the savages because it's the only right way to live, and he's been a a civilized man and a teacher and a bank robber, and he's realized that, you know, that there was just everything was just wrong. He tried all these different lives, and the best life for him was to live in the mountains, and you know, wage war on everybody that was trying to um, to come and find him. So we 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 did try to at least say something about 
the, the situation. And uh, I feel like we were respectful. Being respectful was very important. Then, obviously, it's always a conversation and culture, right? So we, that's, that's the little bit that we put over there, and then we'll see what other people say on it. Um, when we were getting ready, I asked you if you could give me a, an excerpt of Red Dead that expresses what you really, or sums up what you wanted to do, what your ambition was, and you said that's complicated. That's not possible. But there is one sequence that stands out, that's what we were saying at the end of the era, at the end of the Wild West, and you chose the very beginning, the credits, the first two minutes of the show, uh, sorry, of the game, and please explain to us why those are important for you. So just a quick excerpt there for you. So the beginning of the game, why is that essential for you? What does it say? Well, it's weird that I didn't mention that sequence just to see my name on the screen and the, and the credits. Um, um, and also, I think I want to say, just to recap what I was saying before I jump into this, obviously, um, that's my personal view of the attitude of the game and the, st and the um, approach that we took to the Native American um, s situation. And I feel like you could ask Dan Hauser, Sam Hauser, um, Leslie Benzies, and, and Ted Carson, and they would give you their own answer um, on what we did. So I'm not I want to make it clear that I'm not speaking as a representative of the company. I'm, I'm speaking at, from my heart as what I felt was um, at least my personal agenda in pushing some decisions for the game, um, since you asked me such a nice question. Um, jumping into this, um, I f that, that moment to me and, 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 and to us uh, you know, leading the game was really our version of depicting it, the canvas that the player would be um, encountering playing the game. And, um, and, and, and really showing where you, where you end, and then walking you through almost like uh, backwards into where you start, and showing you the potential of all the little things that you can encounter in the game. Um, there's a train, there's a big bustling city, um, there's a car that you get to drive, uh, but way later. Um, there's nature. As that train journey continues, you get to see 
uh, you know, people herding cattle, you get to see the valleys, you get to see the desert. Um, as you get off the train and get into your first mission, you see coyotes eating away at a, at a dead body. Um, we, we really wanted to build the opening of the game as a promise to the player. Um, you know, you bear with us for 50 hours, 100 hours, mm -hmm. how many you can put in. You bear with us, and you're going to get all, all this stuff. You're going to get the Wild West. Um, and, and because it was a new game and a new world and a, a new genre, if you will, of, of games, um, we really wanted to make this promise. We made the end, we made that sequence after the whole game was made so that we didn't cheat anything. We didn't, we didn't put something in there that later we would be like, oh no, we forgot the car, or oh, what are we gonna do with it? Uh, everything that is in that sequence, it's not like a movie, it's, it's, in the, ga it's the game. The game is playing that intro in real time. So, um, so everything that's in there is in the game and we wanted that to happen organically, so it's all the promises that we, remember when I was saying all these risks that we wanted to take, all these things we wanted to take? At the end of the game, we, we went back and we said, how do we open this thing? And, um, and it was the idea of just taking the player through that process that we had when we were saying, we're gonna have cars, we're gonna have cattle, we're gonna have rope, we're gonna have coyotes eating people, we're gonna have eagles, we're gonna have deserts. Um, and, and we packed it all over the credits so that at least we made the credits a little bearable and, and, and not wanting you to uh, skip them because it's also like an important um, part of the story. And then Dan Hauser came up with some of those great, super funny lines that you hear between the characters on the train and um, um, you know that brought the whole sequence to life as well. So um, that's the... That's the thinking behind the opening. Rockstar, était alors habitué à des jeux urbains. Rockstar had been play, uh, mostly doing uh, urban games where you had streets là, full of people and everything. Now here you are in a game nature. that takes place out in nature. How did you, you, how did you fill up the emptiness? And, and how did you make people want to go out there and explore this? That was the million dollar question when I started at Rockstar. Um, at San Diego, that was like, how, what do we do now? It was almost like one of those, oh great, we're gonna do a Western, uh, what do we do now? Mm -hmm. um, and so we, we, had, we, we knew we would have a story, we knew we would have missions, we knew we would, we would have you kind of go around, but what makes a GTA game fun and an open world game, like a GTA game, is the ability to kind of ride off for a bit and do little side activities, little mini games, little things, and just really consume the story um, at your own pace, experience the world, absorb it, and really like that metaphor that I used of being the editor of this story that gives you all this content and you kind of string it together. And the, the, the wilderness was great and ter terrifying at the same time. And even worse, I mean, this is a great picture of like, mountains and snow, but a desert, <laughs> a desert was a desert, right? There's like a canyon over here and some tumbleweed over there. What are you gonna do, shoot the tumbleweed? <laughs> and then I remembered the, um, the, day, the, the good old days of Grand Theft Auto San Andreas and the, um, all the procedural stuff that we were doing and all the ambient stuff that we were doing. And, um, and the conversation with the rest of the team became, what if, what if we start generating content around the player so that instead of um, having traffic and the generated content is the route that you take and these crazy drivers and the cops chasing you, um, what if the generated content is something appears over there, something appears over there, there's a person in need, there's somebody getting hanged, there's a robbery. Um, what if we put an echo system in there? So that if you've got animals and mountain lions and cougars and coyotes and snakes and um, you can hunt them. And then the moment you can hunt them, ah, you can skin them. And the moment you can skin a 
a snake, you can skin a cow and a horse and your own horse. Um, so obviously, the, it, it's, it created a, a lot of work mm -hmm. and it created a, an, a, a world of possibilities. And it was kind of like that ha-ha moment that a little bit like the death of the West um, kind of unlocked the creativity of a lot of people in um, very talented programmers, very talented artists, very talented designers to kind of go and create this content. And we, we ended up with a lot of like, like over 70 different things that you could encounter in the game and a bunch of animals that would interact with each other in the game. And then <laughs> I, I remember that you kind of, kn we knew that it would work when people would come with these stories. Like, hey, I was testing the, I was testing the horse and I was riding along and, and this, and this cougar just jumped out of the, uh, just ju jumped out of a boulder and, and attacked me and it killed my horse and I, and, and, and I had to run off and, and it wouldn't stop and I had to kill him. And this is somebody debugging the horse. It's not even playing the game. And all of a sudden, they come with this really excited story. You're like, I was trying to climb and this bear attacked me. <laughs> A bear, at the, and and so it's like, oh great, a bear attacked you. We need to put a bear fighting mini game, right? Obviously, that's the answer. It's not like, oh, what do we do now? It's like, let's add more content to the game. Um, so that's that's when we knew that, you know, we had on, we had stumbled onto something with the the things happening around you, and um, and like everything, sometimes you you can't plan for it. It just you need you need to venture into the unknown without a map, otherwise you never go anywhere. Mm -hmm. So I think we got started on the game and then asked the million dollar questions and came up with the answer that, that worked. You have someone else who wants to ask you a question, who is someone you worked with a long time ago. Hello question, this is Serge Ascot Ubisoft. Voilà, J'aimerais que tu nous parles un peu du feu de camp de Red Dead Redemption. Tu m'en avais parlé il y a quelques années, j'avais trouvé ça super intéressant. J'en parle souvent aux équipes de développement chez Ubisoft. Je te remercie, à bientôt, au revoir. Um, yeah, the, uh, he was talking about the campfire. Oh, yeah, yeah. Campfire. Um, thank you, Serge. <laughs> uh, Serge used to be my boss at Ubisoft. He's actually the guy that hired me at Ubisoft in what I think was my first real job in the industry working for a big company. So thank you, Serge. I wouldn't be here today probably if you didn't give me that job. Um, so uh, the campfire, <laughs> again, it's like a long time ago. It's hard to remember how these things happen because sometimes it's like, oh, we have, of course, we have campfires in the game. I think it was what one of the very first things that we put into the game to create the the atmosphere, the vibe of being the Wild West. Um, and it was just to show ourselves and to show Sam and Dan and you know everybody basically that, that this could give you the emotion of being in a in a Western. And I think it started it literally started with um, how do we how do we create some content, how do we start a demo? Um, Let's start at the campfire. And um, and then you go and you look at it and you go, oh, this is great. We could kind of make it so that you can create a campfire. And then you put it on a button so that you can create a campfire. I was the lucky one that ended up with the fantastic job of having to write the code to create the campfire everywhere. So if sometimes people wanted to create the campfire and it wouldn't do it, or we'd do it over there and move them you know, all over the world where they didn't want to go. That was me, <laughs> sorry. I hope I didn't screw up your game too much. But um, you know, obviously it ended up being a little more complicated than what we expected, but just this idea that it, it's, there's no better way to communicate that you're like in the wild west and you're even if the West is dying, you're still out there, you're riding, civilization is catching up with you, and you have nowhere to sleep, and you roll out a mat, and you have a little fire, and you lay down, and you can see the stars, and it's not polluted enough so that you can't see anything. They're all like there, all right there, twinkling away, and, and, it, and you're just 
you know, in that moment with the fire, uh, you know, sparkling away. And, and I feel like that was an image that we wanted and a feeling. And then it became, from that feeling and that image, it became something that we desperately wanted to put in the game and something that we desperately wanted to use. And it became how you save the game. It became how you, um, you know, you, you equip. You, you have different types of equipment in your camp according to the uh, camp that you have. And um, we wanted to do a lot more with a campfire. We, we wanted to have, like, people showing up. And, but, but the bottom line is that it, it all started, again, with that, uh, trying to convey an emotion into the game, trying to show what it's like to be in a Western, and then it evolved into somebody saying, hey, maybe, I genuinely don't know who, but somebody saying, hey, let's just create a campfire wherever we want, and, um, and eventually me having to write the code for it and, uh, and trying to maybe push it a little too much. But, um, but it, 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 it goes down to a, like an emotion, like, a, let, let's put a, uh, like let's put a bit of story on screen. Attention, on va spoiler un peu le jeu pour ceux qui n'ont pas fini, donc je pense que vous l'avez tous fini. Um, la fin du jeu est très marquante. The parce end of the game la, la is really stands up because you have the <coughs> death of the hero, John Marston, and then uh, later uh, with his uh, son, Jack. Was that an idea that you had early on? And was it complicated to, to like move over from one character to the other, to hand down, as it were? Um, well, first of all, um, killing, killing John at the end was... Sorry for the spoiler. People. Spoiler <laughs> alert, John dies at the end. Um, it, it, it was a bit of a controversial decision to begin with because, again, I desperately want it, want it to happen. Um, Sam desperately wanted it to happen. But there were, um, there were complications in the way these games work because um, a GTA game, you can play it forever. Like, you play any GTA game, especially the ones that uh, Rockstar had made up to that point. And, you know, you play a CJ or a Tommy Versetti, and the story's over, and then you can continue playing. You're like the king of, king of the hill, you, you know, own the world. The world is your oyster. Go have fun. Um, and if I kill John, the game's over. You can't continue playing. So um, what do we do? We don't kill John. I don't think it works. I don't think the story needs to the story needs to go somewhere and that's where it needs to go. And so the idea came up of giving him a son. Um that you know, it's one of those things where you go like, "Hey, you can continue on playing as his son." And the moment you say it, and I feel like it was almost like a way for me to come up with a solution. Hey, let's you play as your son. And It became something that was both quite powerful and daunting at the same time. It was powerful because, obviously, it, it, it gave us a lot of ideas. It gave the story like that hopeful epilogue that you wanted. Um, it was meaningful in the whole Death of the West environment we were creating. Um, it gave you somebody to root for, to save at the end. Um, a reason for John to do it, his wife and his kid. Before it was just his wife. But then we didn't realize, certainly I didn't realize, and this I take the credit for, I didn't realize that everything that John was doing that had one line that said, hey, John, now it needed to be, hey, Jack. <laughs> and you could go and play poker, and if you're playing poker, there's people that are talking about the things that you've just done in the game. J Jack goes play poker, it's like years later, John's dead. So y we had to re-record everything that John could do as Jack. We need to re-motion capture all the dynamic cutscenes that we have in the Strangers missions and the mini games so that they would work with Jack. And um, yeah, like we added a ton of work and add towards the end of the game as well. So um, it, was, it, was, it was a tough choice. And so I take responsibility for the extra expenditure and the extra work, but I, 
need to give credit to Sam Hauser and Dan Hauser and, and Leslie Benzies because they bankrolled it. They actually could have said, eh, you know what, kid? Good idea, but no. Kill John Lives or change the story or whatever. Who cares? It's just a game. In fa instead, they said, no, 100%. That's what needs to be done. Let's do it. We need to re record. Let's do it. We need to motion capture more. We need to spend more weeks on more motion capture stage and more actors and more this and more that. Let's do this. And I think that that, again, is what makes Rockstar special, is the, they have the balls to do these sorts of things. And, um, and, and so sometimes you feel like you can't take four and a half years to, take to make a game because um, you, you get supported for it. So we're finished with Red Dead now. We're going to talk a bit about your other projects. You made a film in 2015 called Air. It's your first film. How did, I mean, your experience in video games, what did it, how did it help you writing for cinema? Um, so I had, before uh, directing here, I had done the motion capture for Shadow of Mortar and a bunch of short films just on my own. Um, so I, I had started kind of figuring out the, the technique and honing it a, a little bit. And working in games certainly helped a lot in terms of like the visual storytelling. Um, and for Air in particular, Air is a very confined film that takes place all in a, in a bunker underground. It's a little claustrophobic. And um, it was really important for me that the, that the environment was a character in itself. It felt like a real place. It felt like... Um, it was part of the story, but also was telling the story because um, I didn't want the characters to talk about what's happened or where they are or what they're doing. Because if you're in there and they've been in there for many, many, many years, they wake up for six months, they wake up for two hours every six months, they make sure that all the people cryogenically sleeping in this um, Noah's Ark are uh, doing fine, and then they go back to sleep for six more months. And they've done this so many times that they hate their life. Mm -hmm. And the last thing you want to do when you have two people that know each other so well that they can finish each other's sentences and know this place like the back of their head, the last thing you want to do is like, so why are we here again so that I can hear the backstory? Like it would be true. And so I really wanted the environment to help us tell the story, whether it's like something playing on a monitor, um, something that you can read on a sign, just the, the visuals of the place. Um, I, I, and, and I learned that a lot from, I learned that from, from video games because video games are a really interesting version of visual storytelling that is uh, spatial storytelling, like storytelling with space, which is sort of like a subset of visual storytelling because you can do visual storytelling in 2D, you can do cartoons, um, but with games, really, you're creating a space that tells the story. And in a game, if I put a, a bad guy over there, I'm telling the story. Why is he over there? What's he doing? When did he get there? What is he hiding? Is he standing? Um, if I put a rock over there, I'm telling the story. And if I create something a lot more complex than a rock, a lot more story. And, and so the unique of telling a story with space came in really, really helpful when building something where space was so important, also because that's, frankly, the movie has two actors and the space. So it, it, the, the, the environment needed to be a character. Um, things that I also feel like come from the world of video games, but really come from the world of everything and anything in, in terms of storytelling is the importance of the supremacy of character. Um, really, what you do in video games is writing really strong characters, especially if you want the player to embody them for uh, any length of time. And then you want the stories to come out to these characters. I feel like for Red Dead and Manhunt and many of these games, Shadow of Mortar, the story comes out to the, to the fact that you meet these people and they have needs and desires and you have needs and desires and they clash or combine with each other. And when you when you think in terms of character and and you don't think in terms of plot, 
then you, you end up having an easier life creating a screenplay or a comic book or a game because you're trading the same currency, which is character. Um, the things that I, was, I wasn't prepared for, <laughs> maybe that's another question. <laughs> there were many, many things that I wasn't prepared for. Movies and video games also are very, very different. Um, but we'll see. Um, we're going to talk a bit about uh, uh, Sleep Deprivation Lab because time is marching on here. Sleep Deprivation Lab with Jeff uh, Harkavy. So you set up Sleep Deprivation Lab. What do you want to do when you set this up as sort of a narrative, uh, sort of script doctor? Um, when I left Rockstar um, after uh, the release of Red Dead Redemption, I, I really kind of wanted to... Um, you know, hit the reset button again and kind of explore different ways of telling stories. Uh, I was very interested in film. I was very interested in comic books. I was very interested in television. And um, so it seemed natural to me that I would start with games, which is what I was at least experienced at, hopefully good at, um, and, um, and kind of build from there. And I started Sleep Deprivation Lab, ironic name, obviously, we don't have ch sleep chambers where we keep people awake. I'm the one that stays awake. But um, we, c we created it as a way to offer um, writing and creative services for the games industry. And initially, it ended up being script doctoring. Mm -hmm. And then it, it became um, more like contributing to the narrative from like ground zero, like uh, Shadow of Mortar is, is something that we wrote um, and that I directed the motion capture for um, from from nothing, from just the the conversations with the developers of what game they were making. Um, and then, you know, to where we are today, where thanks, I've been lucky to be uh, exposed to working in cinema, um, I have a comic that's coming out, so we're, we're trying to turn it into a little bit of um, of, of our creative hub, mm. like my creative home, if you will, where some of the things we can hire, we, c we get hired to do, and some of the things we create internally, we, we come up with stories that we love, and from there we, we try to figure out if we can make them into a, into a game or into a movie or VR, and uh, just the the beginning of that new adventure, um, but that's uh, that's what that's what keeps us busy. So we're going to talk a bit about Mordor, a bit more in detail now. How did you how do you structure yourself as a game like Mordor? If I've understood right, it's like as a TV show, but with three script writers in a sort of a writers' room working on it. That's how you set up your work, right? Yeah. Um, when it came time to write that game, um, which, which was a big endeavor, um, and also challenging in terms of the subject matter that we were dealing with, the intellectual property behind it, I mean, it's the Lord of the Rings. It's, it's probably, uh, first of all, it's literature, mm -hmm. and you've got scholars um, doing essays and, and teaching about it. Uh, it's, it's a beloved uh, series of books that has movie adaptations that are Academy Award winning. And so y you step into something like this with a certain level of apprehension at what are we going to do? Yes. It's always that question, what are we going to do? And um, one of the ideas was to look at the television industry. And there's, there's, a, f there's a way of writing that they have in, in television, which is the writer's room, where you put a bunch of different writers that have different skills. You, you sit them together and they all contribute to different angles of the story. And then you divide up what needs to be written. And the beauty of that system is that you can have somebody that's great at comedy, you can have somebody that's great at you know, centering the, sort of the family teams, the family audience, you can get somebody that's great at horror and violence, and you can put them in a room and tell them, okay guys, now you, you work together and you're all contributing what you're great at, um, and it's that orchestra thing again. 
you, you play your various instruments and let's see what jazz we can jam over here. And, um, and, and that's how the, the story for Shadow of Mordor came into play with, with different people and you know, myself as the head writer and obviously the game director, Michael DePlatter, and the, and the rest of the team, sort of like deciding on a direction to go and then really injecting a, a different, different personalities to create something new, something unique for, for the Lord of the Rings. Because the last thing we wanted to do was to rethread the adventures that were, you know, amazingly done in the movies and in the books. And uh, Mike the Platter, the game director, had discovered this really unique angle to the story, which was Mordor, and let's go into Mordor and let's let's get somebody th from this kind of border town, border land of um, the Black Gate that are literally the last bastion of humanity before Mordor, sort of like a border, where you're like let's making sure that nothing spills in. And, um, and let th let's tell his story, just at the time when, when Sauron's coming back. And, um, and kind of we embraced that idea and we kind of ran with it and created, the first thing we did was create the characters that you would meet in the story. Mm -hmm. um, and then from there kind of ended up writing, yeah, the whole game, it's, uh, it's a lot of writing. But um, and and it was seven of seven of, uh, of us at some point. Like when we scaled up, um, it was seven writers in a in a room, kind of typing away. <laughs> I think you even got uh, Tolkien talking specialists in to work on uh, the elf on to talk on elfish or black tongue or whatever. Um, we we had quite a few specialists um, working with you know, the, the developers and with us on the story side. Um, we had Weta contributing um, for the visual, for the visualization side. Um, we had the, the talking estate um, and some of the scholars that collaborate with them to review some of the um, elements that we were putting in the story. Um, you know, just to make sure there's sort of like the ring of power, you know, it's like, okay, that's like the key to the whole thing. Don't screw that up. <laughs> Just do it right. Um, and, and yeah, the, the language is, is, was fascinating to me, especially because I remember reading the books as a kid and, um, and Tolkien was a linguist himself. So just very vividly written and all these different languages and the elves have a language that has grammar and rules and, and, um, we had a specialist that knew not just the the elf language, the uh, the language that you can learn if you <laughs> put in the, the time to kind of go in the appendices of the book. Um, he wrote in black speech. Uh, he, wrote, he wrote several passages for us in black speech. Now, black speech is important for, to the story because it's the language of Mordor. It's the language of Sauron. It's a, it's a version of... Um, the elvish language that um, that it's only spoken there and by his minions, not the orcs, the the more cultured, if you will, and Sauron himself, and um, the writing and the ring himself is black speech. And this black speech is actually not something that Tolkien really developed in his books. There is a few words here and there, um, and so this this scholar linguist. I think his name is David Salo, but I don't remember anymore. It's been a while. But he basically went and studied how the name, how the words the talking wrote um, became from Elvish black speech and figured out the patterns and then created new, well, found all the words that he could find and their meaning and then created new words whenever we needed them and wrote lines for us and paragraphs in black speech that were like completely genuine or at least genuine sounding, the amount of work, like we could have just made it up. Mm -hmm. Like, would you have known? Who would have known? I mean, I don't, mm -hmm. does anyone speak black speech? <laughs> Who would have come and sent me a nasty email saying, nah, actually, your black speech is a little rusty. You know, you got the comma wrong. Um, but no, like, 
Warner Brothers went and hired this guy, and this guy worked for a couple of weeks. God bless him, just <laughs> figuring out black speech for us. But it paid off because when you get Nolan North, who's playing the the uh, the bad guy, the, the the black hand, and he has these you know these lines, especially in the opening when he's reciting this. Um, this is reciting this conversation with the Dark Lord, and it's all black speech. And you give it to him to memorize, and then he's saying it. And it just came to me, and it was like this was this was powerful because it just it just put me right there. You know, I just I just felt like this was the real. I was speaking another language that I needed to learn, and because I needed to learn another language, my brain, you know, like in the movie Arrival, like language kind of twists the way you think, and he was there speaking that dark, evil language, and he became this dark, evil person. So it paid off. It paid off um, to have that guy create black speech for us. So we're going to look to the future now before we hand over to the floor for some questions. Now, how do you, with your experience, how do you see things changing in the future, the design of an open world? What's the next phases for you? <sighs> there are no easy questions here. But yeah. um, the so open world games are are now a genre, you know, it started out as GTA, like um, just a, a sandbox game. That's how they were called back in the day. Um, and they're, to me, they're like a, they're like a great way to, to give agency to the player and tell a story and offer um, multiplayer and content that you can consume when, when you want it. And it's really like, um, to me, that's what, and it's the sense of place. I don't want to forget it. The fact that they, more than any other game, they make you feel like you're inhabiting a real place, whether it's the West or San Andreas or um, you know, wherever, you, you know, the, the world of um, Horizon, the beautiful game. Um, they, they, they make you feel like you're there. So for me, that's, they're, they're going to stay and they're going to evolve in that they're, they're just going to incorporate more multiplayer, more ways to manipulate the story and edit the story content in a way that feels closer to you. Um, right now we get a little bit of the disconnect. This is a story moment. This is a multiplayer. I'm entering the multiplayer. This is a dynamic moment. And I feel like everything is going to be, uh, is going to come together more. Um, you can play something like, um, Zelda Breath of the Wild, and see that they, w they incorporated properties to the items and they gave properties to the things in the world and they said, let's see how, how you can figure it out. You've got fire. You can burn things or you can um, burn yourself. If you're cold, you can set yourself on fire. You're going <laughs> to die, but <laughs> if you then don't die from fire, you're not going to die from cold. Um, so they, they created this possibility space that I think is going to grow more into other games. Um, and really, I think we're going to see a lot of, a lot of open world that innovate in the dynamic stuff, whether it's Shadow of Mortar with the Nevenesis system, or um, Zelda with the properties of the world, um, and, and, more, and more multiplayer content like GTA Online that is going to be borderline uh, MMO in terms of involvement. You're going you to have, have more co-op, you're going to have more story, you're going to have more um, you know, role-playing, even in those sort of like multiplayer-only sessions. So I think those are two. I, I don't have a crystal ball, unfortunately. If I did, I, I would be first thing I would do is play the lottery. But, um, but I, th I think it's, it's easy to see that as a genre, that's, that's where it's going. A final question before we hand over to the audience. If you had some advice to give somebody who wanted to start writing video games today and in video game design, what advice would you give? Um, for me, the most important thing, especially being someone that didn't go to school to, to, to learn how to do this, uh, it's to do stuff. So my suggestion would be to, to make to make stuff. If you, if you want to write for games or if you want to make design games, um, I would recommend 
making games and um, having something to show to the people that eventually will hire you or to the funders that are going to give you money to, to make your dream come true. Um, and it's really, really accessible today in a way that um, it wasn't when I started um, the, the making of the stuff. You know, now the engines are available. You've got Unity and Unreal that you can download and use for free. Um, you, you, you have, um, if, if, if uh, those are like not your cup of tea, there's like text-based editors that you can use for just telling stories. Um, and there's like great ways to put the content out there. Um, I wouldn't look to enrich myself. I wouldn't look at it as a business venture. I would look at it as, a, as an artistic and as a growth and as a learning venture. Um, I also want to say something about the, the, um, the universities and the game schools out there. Um, actually, when I was hiring for Red Dead, I ended up hiring quite a few people from some of these courses at university or um, and these kind of schools. And that's because they, they give you like really strong foundations that, that everybody needs to know if they want to be in games. Like, I love writing and I love telling stories and I'm really, really bad at math. But I learned how to code and I ended up doing a bunch of coding because that's one of the languages of games. It's a little bit like saying I want to be a film director but I, I don't know and I don't want to know anything about a camera or lenses. It's just gen don't do it. Um, similarly, if you don't want to know anything about coding or if you think that a game designer is just the guy that sits there and goes, I have a great idea. <laughs> do it. I, I think you're, you're in the wrong line of business. Um, and, and these schools make you do a little bit of everything. Also, another great thing of these schools, even if, even if they taught you very little and you had really bad professors, they, which they don't, but even if they did, you're going to be meeting people like you. You're going to be meeting somebody that loves doing art, somebody that's better at you at coding, and they're going to like the ideas you have, and maybe they'll have better ideas to complement yours, and you can do something together, and you learn how to do something together. And that's really, really important because um, games are not a solitary activity. Games are like theater, like a band. They're like movies. They're like collaborative endeavors. And you need to know how to play in a team, you need to know how to communicate in a team, and you need to know how teams work and how they do things together. And it doesn't have to be 200 people. It can be three people. But, but that's another really powerful um, tool that you get out to these schools that I didn't have when I started. So I would say either you do it on your own and maybe you find some friends to do it with, or and they can be all over the world because the internet, um, or you just go to one of these schools and, and really invest in your education and in the people that you meet. But you gotta do stuff. Um, it, designing games in particular and writing for games is not about having an idea for a game. Um, I wish it was like that. Thank you very much. Questions from the audience? I'm sure you've got a lot. Oh, finally I can move. I feel like I've been Setting for Get your it. legs a bit, that'll help, huh? Okay. Well, there was a bit of a stretch, but we're sitting again. C'était loin, c'est vrai qu'on s'est un peu étiré, mais on est de nouveau assis. Non, c'est vrai, c'est vrai. Alors, des questions, n'hésitez pas. On va arriver d'une main qui se lève. Microphone. Um, so, hi. Uh, first of all, great talk, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so first of all, thank you and great talk. Um, I wanted to know, when you worked on Manhunt, um, all the first and second part are very intimate, like the violence is very intimate, you get close-up shot, and like when you kill someone, it's always um, a CQC. But when you come to the last part, you get guns and a lot of a lot of them, and it becomes basically a TPS. And 
every work on the violence and the, as you said, the perspective on of violence and the way we see violence kind of disappears uh, when you go when you get the guns. So why did you bring guns to to a knife fight? Never bring a gun to a knife fight, right? Um, th well, thank you for uh, the question, um, and I'm glad that you enjoyed the the talk so far. Um, I think we 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 wanted to add a, a crescendo to the game, um, and we wanted to kind of build a moment in in the story where you're, if you if you recall, the guns don't show up until after you break out of the hunt, so to speak, and you then go after your captors. And I think the, the idea behind it, successful or not, is that we wanted to show that by you know, breaking free of your constraints, you were able to kind of almost enter a different game. Right, almost enter a different world, a different pace, a different rhythm, and um, and also I, I would say personally there was an element of is is the game with this very, very personal structure, very intimate, very dark, very depressing. Is that going to be enough, or or do we need some contrast? Because I'm I'm a big believer of contrast. If you if you don't have light, there is no darkness. If you um, if you paint it all red, then all you have is red, um, and so it was an attempt to to introduce contrast into the game, so that by the time you're at the very end of the game, which is the um, the pixie fight, it's a big boss fight at the end of the game. We strip you of all your weapons again, and you have a shard of glass and a piece of string, and the guy that's trying to kill you is this horribly this naked man wearing a pig mask with a chainsaw. And so, and it's just him, six feet four of him, naked with a chainsaw, and you with a shard of glass. And so we kind of wanted to have, at least I personally, wanted to have a, a change in pace so that it could build up to that and you would go, I wish I had my guns at this particular shard of glass party. Um, and with hindsight, you know, in insight is twenty twenty is the saying. With insight, you look at it and you go, I could have taken some of those ammo. I could have reduced the number of guns, um, and it's completely true. But um, you know, sometimes you look at a at a work and it's the product of its time. And Manant is very much the product of its time and. Um, all the lessons that I learned up to that day and um, the following work I've done was because of the lessons I learned from that game. Hi. Um, thanks for great insights. So far, it's been very great. Uh, I have a question. I've been a writer myself for video games in the past and I faced uh, censorship, and I'm wondering if one day, uh, especially triple A uh, producing companies will tackle on those uh, very controversial subjects such as racism or discrimination and stuff like that, because I think so far a lot of game have been brushing the surface of it, but never really gone deep within the subject. Do you think it's possible for a triple A company today to do such a game? Um, well, I feel your pain. Um, it's not like I haven't worked on things that were censored or <laughs> banned or, um, and, and it's been hard. And when you look at it, my answer to you is I hope so and I want so, and I can tell you today that it's gonna happen, but it, it, it will happen and it has to happen. But, um, Again, if we want games to continue to be relevant in the world of popular culture, unless we want to be relegated back to the kids table that I used in my example. Um, that said, it's on us, it's on the industry to tackle the subject and do it well and, and have an audience and a critical apparatus that can support it. 
when Manon came out, I feel like we were trying to take baby steps, and certainly GTA 3, baby steps into a larger world. And it was very difficult um, for the creators as well as the audience and the critical, the press, the, the critics. Um, as the industry matures, I've noticed that critics are now paying attention to different things than when I started in games. So when I started in games, they were saying gameplay, five, sound, eight. Um, you know, it was more like buying a car. People were trying to say, you're gonna spend this money, so you, the gameplay is okay, the graphics are amazing, it doesn't sound great, final score. And it, it, and it was a, a buyer's guide. And today, you read on very accomplished publications about the cultural value of, of a game. Firewatch or DRS, you know, like you, you, you have an indie scene. An indie scene? I mean, when I started, the indie scene was the industry. Um, so so I, I think, the we, yes, we will get there. We have to get there. I want us to get there. But it, it, there is a number of players that need to play the game in order for that to happen. One is people like you that are willing to take the challenge. The second is the audience. There has to be an audience that's willing to listen to what you're saying. And then there needs to be a critical apparatus that's willing to support what you're doing. Because if one of these pieces is not there, then your work is going to be ignored, it's going to be banned, it's going to go to waste, and ultimately you'll just be talking to yourself, which is not a conversation. Um, but I, but I, do, I do hope that we can get there, and I hope that you will, one of the people will take us there. Hey, thank you so much for coming. You talked a lot about narration, but you didn't talk about more narrative games like Consec Dream and Terratel. So I'd like to have your opinion on that. Um, like uh, Quantic Dreams? Yes, yes. Quantic yes, Dreams yes, or yes. Telltale? Um, well, great work from both companies. Um, David Cage is uh, no tour um, in in games. I I usually respect what he what he does and his perspective. Um, and Telltale, um, they you know they, they, they the success speaks for themselves. Um, I think it's it's really interesting that um, that these games have found the, the audience that they found, and and it's interesting to see the mechanics that they bring into the fore. Um, for me, um, narrative games. So I I love the work. And 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 it's great that they exist. For me, though, story in and narrative in game is not necessarily the s the, the linear um, choose your own adventure or the linear sort of uh, adventure game that some of these companies are created to great success and you know very appealing for an audience. I'm not dissing the games at all, but to me, they're being colored that story games, um, and while certainly they have story, I feel like most games are story games. Most games have and need a story. Um, and I fundamentally su subscribe to a, a slightly different school of thought that I feel like we, we need to give um, a lot of agency to the player, and then we need to kind of l really limit the story and then we kind of have the two kind of clash together with that metaphor of the editor that I, that I gave uh, before. Um, so that you can have somebody that's very engaged and has a strong sense of um, buy-in in what they're doing. But, um, but the story itself is not a choose-your-own-adventure. Um, and, and I feel like um, some of those games sometimes uh, alienate a certain class of players because they they make the decision to not introduce a lot of um, agency or the agency that they introduce is um, somewhat redundant. Like they give you the illusion of having a lot of agency. Um, and um, so, you know, just um, what I love of the games industry is that it's a broad church. You can have uh, games like uh, the Quantic Dream games 
Heavy Rain is a great game. My personal favorite is still um, Fahrenheit. Um, the sort of uh, the one that kind of feet open it up for me. I love some of those more tactile moments that they put in some of those games, um, and you know I love the moral choices that you get to make in in a Telltale game. And if, even if sometimes if you replay the game, you feel like your your emotions sometimes can be played with a little bit. They they kind of reveal the magic of a story by letting you replay it. They open the wizard, the, the curtain, and you can see the wizard. Um, but they're great, they're great games and great stories. Um, so I don't know if I've answered your question, but, um, but I, that's what I think of those games. Thank you, Tio. Right. Uh, 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 I have a question, mostly, how you think you could use VR uh, as a narrative tool? Because it gives the impression that you have more liberty with VR, which kind of may be com complex to exploit uh, with open universe. Because you still have to have a story. And how do you captivate pe uh, the player to follow a bit the story with VR? Uh, VR is very interesting in a whole new kettle of fish. Um, I've, I'm starting now to, to do a few things in VR. and. It's like back to square one. It's back to 1995. You know, I'm like, oh, how do you do this? There's no books. There's no maybe. There's no even Chris Crawford writing anything about it. Um, so, great question, and I wish I had an answer. And I think for me and for a lot of people like me, the answer will be let's tr let's figure it out. <laughs> what do we do now? Hmm. And then sort of doing something and hopefully um, stumbling on ideas as you do it. VR deserves to be um, its own unique thing. I, I think that if we say VR is like a game, it's like a movie, I think we're, we're just betraying the nature of what VR should be. Um, and it, it, uh, Look, I write stories, so for me VR needs to be able to tell stories. Um, that's where my passion is and where my drive is. And I'm not going to do you know, golf games in VR. Um, Unless you're clubbing people to death with them, <laughs> but but uh, but the idea is that you're um, you, you have to discover you know first of all you can't think in terms of like here's a camera and this is what it's showing um, because then the people do this and the camera is now over here and you're not showing the thing and, and the answer is not like put little glows and things so a few struggles to uh, to overcome but I again I I think we're in a good place to explore and find some answers. And, and for me, VR will be VR. It will not be games. It will not be um, simulations. It will be like its own special thing. And we'll see where, what happens. OK, une autre question. Alors, par là -haut. I have a question about uh, the new perspective that you can, we can have uh, in narration. Because uh, we have stories from Japan or European and uh, American uh, writers, but other countries in Africa or maybe in Asia, uh, we don't have many stories about them, their cults, their myths. And do you believe that the industry will go there to uh, find new talents, new uh, new kind of archetypes and stories? Um, again, I think that um, it will really a lot of it will really depend from the people that want to tell these sort of stories. And I think that there is such a richness um, of storytelling and storytelling traditions in some of these um, cultures that, that we haven't explored yet or um, that we've explored just, just very briefly that I think um, absolutely, I, I, I hope that it will happen. And, and I'm tempted to say it would, it would be really great if it was the creators from Nigeria and from some of these um, countries, I if it came from them. Because um, now we have a thriving independent scene and all it needs is to be more geographically widespread. And I compare it to the film industry. At the beginning, the film industry was all indie. Then it became these monolithic big studios. They were you know, doing occasional great movies and really just churning out a lot of other product. Um, then they fell apart. 
They were reborn, but in the process of falling apart, they created independent cinema, independent producers. And from those independent producers and those independent models, a whole slew of filmmakers and world filmmakers and um, kids with an iPhone kind of created Sundance and Tribeca and these amazing avenues of seeing world stories. I think that there is no reason to believe that the games industry is not going to see the same process. There, there's been already uh, an erosion of the big studios that are left to people wanting to do their own thing, coupled with new forms of distribution and financing, and now we, we get these smaller games that have an audience. And I think all that's missing now is really just the full democratization of the medium, so that somebody in, in Nigeria with a great idea and a little team can feel like they can use the medium to say something about their culture and say in a way that's meaningful to the rest of the world. And you know, it only needs to happen once, maybe twice, and then everybody else will do it, and then we'll be downloading and playing these games. We don't need the support of the big studios anymore. What happens, and again, look at film, look at television, what happens is that the big studios appropriate the ideas for, from the independence. The independent movement, it's like the innovation. It's the spark. And the, and the big studios are the machine that needs the spark to keep going. And in games, a lot of the spark is still in-house. But it's going to go away. The spark is going to come from these small teams that would come up with amazing games. And then you'll see the next big AAA game appropriating some of those ideas and, and you know, making more polished, sanitized, family-friendly product. Um, so I think it's coming, and it's not very far. But it will need to come from the people that want to have that voice. They need to, they need to be militant about it. So, uh, yeah. So you were talking about uh, the time where you were building all these systems in uh, Red Dead Redemption, which created some new experiences and narratives. And you've done. I mean, I don't know if you work on that, but on uh, the Shadow of Mordor again, with like the the enemies. And do you think, like, could you first tell us, like, how was it writing for that, and also what future have games with all those like systems which create uh, emerging narratives? Um, thank you for the great question. Um, my my work on Shadow of Mordor was actually to take uh, allow the story to take a step back and the player to use all these systems like the nemesis system to engage with the world that was a byproduct of the story. So um, we did that by focusing on characters so that we would have all these characters that created little stories and the big characters are in the cinematics and then they follow you around in the game and the smaller characters you just meet them in the world and um, and we wanted to create a story. All stories are character-driven. All the, all the good stories come from character. But in Shadow of Mordor in particular, we really embrace that idea that the whole game is about characters. The whole Nemesis system, Nemesis, defines some of the characters that you meet in the game. And so we really wanted the story to be less about the plot and less about the, you know, the big monumental things that happen in some of these stories, and, and more about like the little stories of these people that inhabit this land, where there is a, a dwarf that's hunting um, the, 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 the beast that killed his brother, or the, um, the runt orc that wants his own personal vendetta and is using you as, a, as his blunt instrument of uh, death. Um, we, we focused on the characters, and the idea was, the whole game is focused on characters. So that's how the story and the Nemesis system kind of cooperated. They cooperated by saying, yeah, it's great to be able to knife people, and it's great to be able to jump off buildings, and um, it's great to have these big epic moments where uh, the, the music swells and the story has a big suspenseful beat. But really what matters are the people. What really matters are these characters. And here's a system that you can use to meet them, the story, 
because the story is its own system. And here is a system that you can use to interact with them, the nemesis system. Um, there is another system to <laughs> interact with them, the combat system. You're butchering them, but you're still interacting with them. It's a love, love uh, statement. Um, and so, so that, that, that's that for Shadow Mortar. I hope I answered your question. F the future is going to play. Th this, these systems are going to be in play for the future. There's, there's obviously more to be done with things like uh, the Nemesis system. And Ken Levine is working on um, creating a Lego system for stories. Um, it'll be really interesting to see what happens. I remain, again, I remain of my position that the best story is a linear story. Um, and the best agency that we can give the player is the role of the editor. And if the story is character driven, the editing of the various pieces of the story is going to empower you to discover the narrative as opposed to uh, do a choose your own adventure booklet. That said, I'm really excited to see what other people, um, maybe more gifted than me or maybe with interests in other areas, where they go between this f perpetual battle of uh, story and gameplay. Um, but, but I certainly think that we're going to keep exploring um, in that area. Bonsoir. Euh, tout d'abord, euh, merci pour votre présence, ce qui est très bien surpris. Et désolé de ne pouvoir vous poser la, la question en anglais, ce qui m'amène justement à vous poser celle-ci. Que pensez-vous de la quasi, de l'aspect quasi hégémonique de l'angle, de la langue anglaise dans l'industrie du jeu vidéo Et pensez-vous que des productions dans d'autres langues et de l'avenir I didn't get ah, that. Did you, okay. Um, he was asking, uh, do you think that it would be possible in the near future maybe to have uh, video games in another language than just English? He, he, he just said that um, we, we, we all, all the games are in English t nowadays. Do you think it maybe it will change? Maybe someday we will have games in the U UK or in the US in French, subtitles like, you know? Um. C'est ça, je ne sais pas, c'est à peu près, bon, l'hégémonie, il y a l'English hégémonie in video games. Ouf. Um, okay, I'm leaving. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, it's, um, it's an interesting question, and I, I, I think that there is an element of it that is, again, I, I, just, I just look at the big conglomerates and the small independents. Um, and, and I think a lot of games actually get dubbed into mm. other languages like movies. Um, ultimately, I think it, it boils down to market and production. So the game is marketed to uh, an international audience, and the money is for like one set of um, acting, and then everything is subtitled. Then I think. If it's a for an international audience done by a big um, studio, it's chances are it's going to be English. Chances are going to be English just because of, um, you know, I don't, I don't personally care. I'm, I was born in Italy, but um, I, I think there is just an element of like the language of the world. There's so many people that speak English. You guys are so wonderful. So many of you have asked me questions in, in English. So. Um, there is uh, there is the you know the the path of least resistance, um, and then there is again like looking at world cinema. If the people that produce, write, and make the game, do it in France, um, the game should be in French. It should be acted in French by French people, written in French, and then it should be subtitled in another language, and people should be able to go a French game. Um, uh, Japanese game. It's in Japanese, right? So that's kind of already, in a way, happening because the Japanese are like, we don't care. We're just going <laughs> to do it in Japanese. So, um, I, so I feel like the answer, again, without always taking the back door to get out of the questions, is it depends on who makes it. And really, the creators have a lot of the cards. But if you go to the big mainstream players, you are really going to miss your industry 
who wants to make a buck while they're doing this, saying, hey, can we make a buck by making the game just in French? And unless it's a, like a gimmick, which I don't think is what you want, like, oh, yeah, the queer kick French game. Unless you want to do that, then chances are they're going to be like, here's the numbers, here's the spreadsheet, and it sucks, but it's going to be in English. Let's get Nolan North and Troy Baker. Uh, <laughs> you know, like it's... Um, but if it's made, in, it's, if it's made here, n nobody should come and tell you, ah, you should do it in English. Unless, you know, you are making it within the framework, within the box of the conglomerate. Um, Une dernière question, et c'est la fin de la masterclass. Vous l'entendez Hello and thank you. I wanted to ask, uh, do you think uh, conven conventional uh, open world games like GTA or Mafia 3 can learn something in terms of storytelling from uh, less conventional open world games like, like Dark Souls 1 and Bloodborne? Very specific. Um, <laughs> sure. I, I, I mean, in terms of like le learning things, we all need to learn from. Yeah, we all learn from one another, um, and we all like. Like I said, we actually steal from one another. Uh, I think that it's really part of the artistic process. The idea of appropriating, creatively appropriating something and changing it, making it your own so that you're standing on the shoulders of giants. Now, we all do it. Whether we do it deliberately or subconsciously, I think if you write anything or you paint anything, you better know what you're doing because there's a lot of stuff that's been done before you. Um, in those particular examples, um, the trick for the open world and the, and the conflict with the more linear world, if you will, is that certain luxuries that you have in a, in a more linear game, I'll, I'll add to the list the Uncharted games or the um, Last of Us, um, is, is they, at the end of the day, they, they, can put you on a, they can put you on a track of which they have complete control. And they can, more importantly, they can pace it in a way that by very definition, you can't in an open world game because I'm here telling you, let's go, let's go, let's go, and you're over there playing poker for a day. So the narrative needs to somehow not say that a nuke is going to go off in 24 hours if you're playing poker. Jack, what are you doing? Go stop the nuke. So, so it, it, do you understand? There's like a limit to, to both. Um, you know, linear games can't give you the editorial power, the active sense of being there that an open world game can do it. Because you can't go and play poker instead of being there, you know, knifing the pig mask people. So, um, but lessons to be learned, 100%. And a lot of the games that you mentioned are character driven games that, that peg everything on on the personalities that they create. And I, and I think, and I'll, I'm probably starting to sound redundant here, but I feel like those are the things that you need to take from some of those games because structure is very important. And if you have something that's structured like Bloodborne or uh, The Last of Us, you can't take that structure and expect it to work in an open world game because you can't take a, the, you know, a three-seater and turn it into a, a seven-seater and expect it to go at same speed, same same handle the same way. It's just not. Um, and similarly, you know, those games, the structure of those games works in those formats. But there are things that you can take away from those games. And characters is one of them. So if you if you look at what worked in, with those characters, with those beats, uh, then you can incorporate those lessons in an open world game or in a tabletop game or in a movie. Like there, there are there's universal elements to that.
Well, thank you very much. We've got to thank everybody now. I'd like to thank uh, the teams here that uh, made this masterclass possible, the people from Juvideo Magazine who are here, who are uh, great supporters. I mean, the perfect, the 17th one, the people from the Cité des Sciences et de l'Industrie who are welcome here, wonderful with uh, Fabrice and his team, with the directors, the sound people, lots of people back there. Give them a quick round of applause. Big it up. Thanks to uh, our partner Orange, uh, without whom this masterclass would not be possible. Their support and uh, the great partnership that we've had uh, for five years now, four or five years now. And finally, of course, thank you, Christian, for coming along to be with us tonight. A great present you gave us. A wonderful gift. And, well, no, I'll shake your hand later on, but before we go and have a photo with the audience, I'd just like to give you a final word for the audience. What would you like to say? Well, thank you for coming and listening to me rant on for a couple of hours here. Um, you know, you guys are the reason why me and people like me do this, um, so it's great to, it was great to have you over and it was great it's always great for me to uh, see so much passion in people that play games, live games, want to make games. So if uh, if anyone in this audience wants to make games, please don't stop, keep going. And if you guys play games, be, uh, yeah, please keep playing. I mean, if you don't, get started, get on, get on with the program. Okay. And thank you so much for coming tonight. Don't move, we're going to have a photo. We're going to try and have as many people as possible. So a little selfie. See if we can do that. Oh, yeah. Oh, sure. With the audience. It's a selfie with like a little log hand. <laughs> oh, there's nobody left there. They've all gone to the bar. Merci beaucoup, merci. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it was fun. Pardon?